Hello there. Thank you so much for joining me. Let me pause. <clears throat> All right, Joel from Miami, Tamara from Santa Barbara, California. Excellent. Lucy, Lacey, sorry, Lacey, Chesapeake Humane Society in Virginia. Joel's from Grace International. Excellent. Wonderful. And you know what? If you could do me a favor and hit that blue box in your in your chat in the chat panel and send it to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see where you're calling in from and who's on the call. We've got Karen from Kansas City, Missouri, and Nicole from Dallas, Texas. Let us know what organization you're calling in from as well. We'd like to know what organization. Lori from Chicago, Anne from Vancouver, excellent, from New Hope Community Services, great. And Philip from Ghana, you may get the prize today from the farthest. Excellent. All right. Ed from Houston, welcome. All right. So if you're just joining us, you know, we've got seven minutes. Thank you for being my early birds. <clears throat> All right. Amy from Iowa. Great. Excellent. Ganiu, I'm sure I'm not saying that correctly, from, for, from Americas for Africa, welcome. Excellent, Scott in South Carolina, Tessa from Ottawa, Philip from Theovision International. Uh, all right, Nicole, three designing women. Excellent. All right. Nice to see you guys here. We will get started in five or six minutes. Um, excellent. Susan, hi, how are you from Cape Cod? Is it beautiful today? It is overcast here in New Jersey. Uh, Deborah from Houston, early music. Great. Uh, nah, it's not beautiful today. Um, overcast here too. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to, I think later in the weekend, they're predicting sunshine here. Oh, I'm back in my office. Yes, I am. The kids fought me for the basement. <laughs> they're playing video games down there. So I am back upstairs. Hopefully we won't hear too much noise. Uh, Betsy from Cincinnati. All right, so listen, we um, are having a super special guest today, Tom Ahern. If you don't know him, if you're not familiar with him, um, you are in for a treat. So if you brought specifically a question about donor communications and how they can raise you more money or something for Tom, go ahead and put it in the Q&A box now. All right. D, hello from Massachusetts, warm and humid, but overcast here. Andrew, nice to see you. Seaman Society for Children and Families, living in New Jersey, work in New York. Yep, are you commuting, Andrew, or are you working from home these days? Uh, yes, okay. All right, Amy says he is well known for appeal letters. If you don't know him, you will definitely learn today. Excellent, okay, Andrew, like, most of us, we are remote. Okay, so listen, just to remind folks and for anybody that's new, there's two places to communicate with me and others today. One is the chat box. So in your control panel, you'll see the, the talk bubble. It's the chat box. Um, that's for the chitter chatter. If you have specific questions uh, for me that you want me to address or our guest today, Tom, go ahead and open up that Q&A box. Um, so hello to Anna from Easter Seals, Canada. Doug at the Venice 
Family Clinic in Venice, California. Frank in Fairbanks, Alaska. Hello. And Andrea, beautiful sunny weather here in Monterey County. Ooh, 535 at pets adopted since March 1st. Is that a record? Excellent. Yeah, if anybody else wants to share fundraising success stories or program success stories, let's hear them. Nancy from Nashville and Kimberly from Santa Fe Springs, California. All right. So hopefully Tom will be joining us shortly and he will be speaking about donor communications and how they can raise you more money. All right, Doug set a record, exceeded our annual target by, by $4 million. You exceeded your annual target. Wow. What kind of organization are you at Doug? And what's your, what, what was your goal? that you exceeded by $4 million. Give me a sentence or two about how you did that. All right. All right, okay, we'll get started in just a minute or two. Let me see, make sure that Tom's not having any trouble logging on. Excellent. All right, I'm just checking in with Tom now to make sure that he's not having any trouble logging on. I sent him a message and I do not see anything from him. So I think we are good. All right, let's see here. All right, uh, let's see, let's see. Now I've got to look back in the, in the chat here. All right, same period. Let's see, Andrea says same time period, 2019. Oh, not a record, but pretty close. Okay, that was about um, pet adoption, I think. Um, oh, Doug says Venice Family Clinic, goal was 10 million, huge outpouring of contributions in response to COVID-19, good for you. All right. Okay, and Susan, you're having a lot of volunteers, but people want people want to help, but mostly focused on event type fundraising. All right, here, let's see. Okay. I am, we're just getting started, so don't worry. Um, and it doesn't matter if you don't have a computer camera, hopefully you can see me. And I am gonna put you on hold. Okay, we're just calling Tom Ahern to see, make sure that he's getting on and that he's not
Okay, he's coming. Tom's coming. We had a little technical difficulty. All right. All right. Uh, let's see, recording alert. Unmute myself. Okay, everybody can hear me. Okay, good. I'm back. I'm back. Sorry about that. Um, hopefully, Tom will be logging in momentarily. Anyways, um, I've just been asking everybody to go ahead and put in where they're calling in from. There he is. There he is. Dun, 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 dun. He's Hello. There. Hey, let's see. Is that your real back wall or do you have one That's, of those? No, that is my real back <laughs> wall. That is kids artwork and all sorts of good stuff back there. Yes. How are you, Tom? I'm good, Amy. Uh, I see. What do we got? 14 people coming in, 15, so forth and on. Yeah, good. Oh, well, you're, you're just, your Zoom is catching up because I've got over 250 people on the line right oh, now. Oh, oh, you're in New Jersey, right? <laughs> We're in New Jersey, yes. Yeah, yes. you need a mobster name. <laughs> I do, huh? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Amy reputation. Big Bucks. <laughs> I think that's what I'm going to use from now on. So what are we going to call you? I don't think I'm, you know what, that's why we're going to talk about donor co communications because you are so creative <laughs> coming up with this stuff. What are we going to call you? It's going to take me, I think we turn to the town hall. Every, anybody who wants to come up with a mobster name for Tom, <laughs> go ahead and put it in the chat. So listen, Tom, uh, mm. we've got, we've got, almost 300 people on the line now, um, all here to hear about donor <laughs> communications. And Soon to be disappointed to... <laughs> people. Yeah. No, they are not, they are not. So listen, um, uh -huh. no, intro no introduction I could give you would, give, would do you justice, but let me, oh, all right, Nancy's gonna call you Tommy, tell it like it is. <laughs> <laughs> do you have the chat box open? Perfect. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Tommy, yeah. tell it like it is. All right. I'll, I, I not only can live with it, I hope to live up to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, Nancy, you get the prize for today. Nancy gets the prize <laughs> for Tommy, tell it like it is. Okay. So listen, let me just try and give you a little introduction. You can feel free to add or subtract anything that you like or don't like about what I'm going to say right now. Um, first of all, Tom, I don't know if you like to monitor the chat or the Q&A box. Um, I have both open myself. Uh, let me know so that I can either verbalize it or if you'll be following along with me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so listen, I first met you, I'm telling everybody else. <laughs> Long I time ago. I, more than 10 years ago, more than 10 oh, years yeah. ago. Yeah. And yeah. probably 12 or 13 years ago, Tom was speaking. He was the keynote speaker at the AFP New Jersey conference on whatever it was. And I was an aspiring consultant and I went up to him afterwards and I said, oh boy, I wanna be like you. <laughs> How can I, how can I? And graciously, he spent the better part of an hour at least uh, chatting me up and, and giving me all his words of wisdom. And he has been a, a mentor, a friend, a colleague ever since. And mm -hmm. Tom is an author, a well-respected expert in our field, a, an author of multiple books. Just Google him or Amazon hit his name and fundraising, donor communications. You want to hold any of them up? You have any of them nearby? I, I always have them nearby. I, I basically rewrite the same book over and over. Yeah. All right. We won't tell. All right. <laughs> Too okay, late. so so listen, Tom. There's there's about 300 people on now, and if you do want to open the chat box, you can uh, see how you know people from near and wide. We've got people okay. from as far as Africa. Yeah, normally, Alaska. I don't do that, but let's All see. Right, is that the Q and A? No, no, no. The Q and A is in. Oh, the Oh, I see the box. chat. I see the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm gonna read you the Q and A. Tom the tickler. <laughs> I'm not. not. I'm not even seeing that one. That's funny. Yeah. Tom Foolery, Tombstone Tom. Tommy Too Good. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. We got a great group here. So listen, we're going to talk about donor communications today and mm. how they can raise you more money. Uh, so, you know, in the context, of course, of COVID-19 and what we're all going through. So why don't Thanks. you get, why don't you start us off with <clears throat> some 
just an overview of what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you're advising people. You know, mm -hmm. uh, let's start us off with our key takeaways for the day. <laughs> what do you want people to know and leave with before we get into their questions? Well, yeah, this this certainly an abundance of bad news out there, but there has been a surprising amount of good news and not entirely just for charities that are forward facing on the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis itself. Um, what Mark Phillips research found, and he is uh, the founder of Blue Frog, as you know, Amy, and he's over in London. And they, um, they do a lot of uh, donor research all the time. So basically, as the coronavirus thing started to rise, they were already, um, talking to donors, well, uh, how does it make you feel, et cetera, et cetera. And what they've found is that the, the first condition is, are you financially pinched? And if you lost your job and you were, you know, charitable and philanthropic, you're, you've probably shut down that part of your life temporarily. Um, but as we know, um, at least in the United States and probably most of the other English speaking countries, the, uh, the biggest percentage of donors are people 55 and older. And in fact, almost half of them are 65 and older. So um, some of them, probably a good percentage of them already have their financial house in order. So this was not a catastrophe for them financially. And those people are still giving. They, they, what Mark found was that they saw no reason to stop giving to the charities that they believe in and love and respect. And, uh, and they are also giving additionally to charities that are doing something about coronavirus, whether it's direct kind of medical service or it's helping people that have, uh, let's say, lost a waitressing job and are facing um, being thrown out of their, their rental apartment. And so they need some help to cover these months and so forth. But yeah, I mean, ultimately this, is, when did we raise a ton of money in April and <laughs> May? It, this is when people are, you know, stocking up on suntan lotion. They're not giving to charity. The giving season is months away, and yet we we are kind of hitting some high waters right now. Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, Linda in the comments says we already exceeded our six month fundra fundraising goal, one hundred and fifteen percent just in April and May. I mean, yeah. that's you know. <laughs> you know, you it's, know. It, I mean, it depends on what kind of charity you are, of course, and and places that depended on audiences, uh, schools, museums, theaters, and so forth. They're um, they are you know having to recreate everything from the ground up, um, but. Uh, I know there, uh, you know, there's a, a couple of senior, um, either housing or senior center related um, charities that I've talked to in the last couple of weeks. And uh, I mean, the money just kind of magically appeared because mm. people just, you know, it, they knew I want to help. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right, but don't say magically because you know the oh, fundraisers never, that are. <laughs> no, it's never magic, of course. No, it's not magic. It's not magic. It's the hard work of all the people on this call that are making the magic happen, right? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, indeed. Yeah. All right. All right. So, um, so how? So there's good news. There's bad news. I mean, you know, what I'm finding is that the people that are out there asking, working their fundraising plan, communicating with their donors, they are mm -hmm. actually doing extremely well in terms of their fundraising results. So yeah, yeah, yeah. What, That's what, advice, what I'm hearing too. Yeah, what advice in terms of donor communications are you giving your clients and others right now? What, sh what should fundraisers be doing to communicate? Well, um, <laughs> as with all things, uh, where boards have an opinion, they, the opinion of choice was to rush in and say, well, let's, we're not going to bother our donors. We're not, you know, they've already got enough on their, their mind and, you know, we shouldn't go just be part of that. 
And um, that, uh, as it usually is with um, boards, they, it was exactly wrong. And, you know, it was stupid and uninformed. And, and they, they just, you know, they, they're, they're not thinking like what they're supposed to be thinking like, which is as business people, in a sense, you know, you're running a, a small business when you're running a nonprofit and you're, you're in charge of governance. Instead, they're thinking like, themselves i i'm i'd hate to be solicited right now it's like oh the, you know your personal opinion is 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 of absolute no no value to uh to your you know results so there's been that problem we have <laughs> jeff brooks who is the uh if you go to Future Fundraising Now, which is his free blog, and he posts pretty much daily, there was a great one uh, a couple of weeks ago by Jeff, just listing all the objections he had heard from various people, you know, why we are not doing fundraising right now. And, uh, you know, in some ways, you kind of look at it and go, oh, here we go again. Now you've come up with a new excuse for not doing your work. You know that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm going so far as to tell organizations that if they're not fundraising right now, they're being negligent. They're neglecting their don't their clients, their community, their organization, mm -hmm. because you know the organizations that are fundraising are doing significantly better. I mean, we learned that lesson in 2008, and I know mm -hmm. that there are not all good comparisons to 2008 but there are some lessons learned and the organizations that fired their development staff stopped raising money <laughs> you know they didn't do well let me tell you it's no surprise it's sort of the most obvious thing in the world and the the organizations that worked their plans kept talking to their donors um, yeah, I mean, you don't, it isn't like you work your plan pretending that coronavirus doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> that, right. You know, it's it, that uh, you're always working in the context of your times. And, and right now, we're all kind of in the same bad boat. And that makes it, in some ways, it makes communications much easier because you have a pretty guaranteed way of connecting with people right away you, you know how are you doing and and that i bring i bring that up because it was one of the emails that um uh was most successful in the early days of the of the crisis where charities would reach out to their base and just ask how are you doing right right, right. here's here's what we're doing uh, how are you doing? Here's what we're going to do. And we're going to stay in touch because part of this, and, and this is, you know, this is trying to put the old transactional view of um, fundraising in the rear view mirror. Uh, we are trying to have these families of purpose, these small families of purpose that are committed to something and and most of your money as as you, you well know amy big bucks comes <laughs> from <laughs> a, uh 80 yeah. percent is coming from 20 percent of your your base of your list and so those those truest of true believers are uh people that you really want to be solidly in touch with now in part because uh, psychology, one of the things that um, Mark Phillips in his research brought up, he said people are feeling lost, they're feeling helpless, they're feeling powerless, and they, they need to feel under, in some ways in control, and, and that's why they're hoarding toilet paper. Okay, so that makes, you know, now I'm in control. I've got all the toilet paper I will need <laughs> for eternity. Uh, but he said, you know, if, if, um, what you can bring to people is a way to kind of fight back, to say, I'm going to do something. Here's something you can do right now to help somebody else. Because that's, I mean, philanthropy, it, it's a, we are a social species. It is built into brain evolution and all the rest of it. We're not all equally philanthropic all the time, uh, but there, it's there. And, um, and what it is, is I will help somebody else, you know. 
I'm not trying to cut them off in traffic or, you know, screw them out of something. I will help somebody else. And that's, uh, that impulse um, is very, re it's calming, it's reassuring, it makes people feel better. I've been spending the last month working on an online course with uh, uh, Jen Chang, and you know Jen, mm -hmm. she's a psychologist. Um, and it is about taking principles of psychology and how do they weave into uh, people's fundraising behaviors. And um, it, it's been fascinating. I, I got to say, I, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not always um, following Jen. She's a very deep thinker and um, <laughs> and an academic and so forth. But uh, uh, what she, what she's shown to me is we've got the when somebody makes a gift. If well, let's put it this way, Amy. When they make a second gift, mm -hmm. because often the first gift is an impulse purchase of some kind. And, um, but if they made a second or third gift, uh, they're telling you something about themselves. And at that point, the, uh, the, the charities that are awake to this start to try to have more of a dialogue with them. Yeah, and I think let's, let's pause on that point for a second, because I want to make sure that everybody was paying attention to what you said. Um, and not everybody is up to date on donor retention statistics and issues as probably you are. So um, when, when Tom's talking about a first time donor making an impulse decision, right? Um, they're reacting to maybe COVID-19 or they're reacting to uh, a friend is running a whatever, ask if somebody has cancer. <laughs> well, not anymore, but they are doing it. <laughs> Nobody's running a marathon, whatever, whatever the issue is, right? They, they had an impulse, they, or they're reacting to your direct mail. Maybe, you know, they're, they're a first time donor and they saw one of Tom's newsletters and they said, okay, now I'm going to give to this organization. Im impulse gift. So the question is then, can you, what can you do to encourage the second gift and the third gift? And then their psychology is different. So, and, and as well, Tom and I know, and hopefully you know, that donor retention rates go up very significantly if you can get that first-time donor to make a second and even a third gift. So um, I just wanted to point that out. Um, we have questions coming in. Can oh, I go to some of the questions? Town hall. I forgot. We're in a town hall. We're, this we're is in a lecture. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, but, it's not a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> we can do a yes, little of both. Yes, questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Our, all right. So Tamara's asking, I'd love to hear changing trends in donor communications over the last decade, if any, uh, maybe the last decade and then over the last two, two months. <laughs> I, I have the answer. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> first of all, uh, um, the answer will never be whatever shiny new thing has just appeared. So those, those are um, for a completely operational fundraising shop, the shiny new thing can produce some additional revenue, but it will never, um, it will never replace knowing the basics. So the basics are you ask for my help somehow, digitally in print, somehow in person, uh, or on stage you get up and say, you know, we depend heavily on uh, donor support and so forth and so on. So you ask for my help, then you thank me for that help. And then many times we kind of revert to our, you know, childhood behaviors where your mom said, you know, I know granny gave you socks for Christmas or for Hanukkah, but you still got to thank her. Oh, thank you, grandma. I love the socks. And, you know, we kind of treat it like that when in fact it's a, it's a probably the most important uh, first step in a an attempted relationship with somebody who has made, you know, gotten out of their inertia and made the effort to give you that first gift. The first gift is relatively easy, um, relatively easy. Nothing is easy in fundraising, but relatively easy. The second gift is so much harder. And what we know from the uh, Fundraising Effectiveness Project is that about 80% of first-time donors do not make a second gift. And that's been consistent data for years and years. And if anything, it's gotten much, it's getting worse. 
there's, um, we're overwhelmed, first of all, by charities. We have 1.5 million in the United States. And the, uh, the amount of uh, messaging aimed at everybody's head is overwhelming. And so we basically try to block it out as much as possible. Um, where are we going? Oh, okay. So trends in communications <laughs> tomorrow. Sorry. Uh, you're going to get the lecture even if you don't want the lecture. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. I, listen, I've been doing listen. nothing but writing a course for a month. It's, I, lecture is my mode right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, then I think the nickname you were given early on in this session, Tommy, tell it like it is, is going to stick. <laughs> okay. Uh, Let me just quickly yeah. tell yeah. the rest of you know, our... Here's what happened. Around um, 1994, uh, a guy named Ken Burnett over in the UK published something called Relationship Fundraising. And it was a book of, uh, he was running one of the bigger direct mail firms in the UK, worked with all the majors. And uh, his insight, and it was still theory at this point, but his insight was we we're looking at these people as wallets, not as people. And if we stop looking at them as just sources of cash and start looking at why they're giving in the first place, then we are going to make more money. That was the basic thesis of Ken's book. So then Penelope Burke came along in the early aughts and she had her book, Donor Centered uh, Fundraising, whatever it is. And um, it, she had her research that showed, yeah, in fact, that's true. And then Adrian Sargent, uh, professor, Adrian Sargent, marketing professor, and his, his uh, colleague, wife, Jen Chang, a psychologist, they started to do their very, rig very rigorous research. And they found, wow, you know, if you talk differently to your, um, your base, these like first time donors, if you make some, a different kind of effort to connect with them at a slightly deeper level, which is the, their, what they call the identity level, um, then you can uh, grow your giving significantly. In, and the conclusion for me anyway, and I'm, I'm always been a bottom liner, the conclusion was, before, this is called donor centricity. We're now up to donor centricity 3.0. This is in the aughts, we were doing donor centricity 1.0, which is, you know, you, you could get the starter kit was you just throw the word you in every about every 15 words, you know, <laughs> that, that's how you get started. And uh, what we found was if you treated the donor as the hero rather than the organization as the hero, you'd make a ton more money right away. So we had newsletters that made a thousand percent more between one issue and the next because of the way they spoke on the front page. We had, well, last two years ago up in Scotland, we um, started teaching a master class, we being Adrian, Jen, and myself, on this idea. And the promise to people was you'll make twice as much money in something like 12 to 18 months. And now we have the, we have those people coming back to us saying, well, it wasn't twice as much. It was three times as much. So we're, if the days of the, you know, of, if you can get by on low hanging fruit, then don't change what you're doing. If, <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, so Tom, let's, you know, listen, I think sometimes you're so familiar with your materials that, you know, you're making assumptions that people know some of the things. So let's clarify. When Tom says you're throwing you into your donor communications, when you're writing a letter or a newsletter appeal, you know, the old version was, we are so great. This is what we did. Our organization did this. We did this. And Tom had you go through your letter or your newsletter and circle all the time that you said you or no, sorry, we and our and we did this and we're so great and look at us and replace them with you. Make the donor the hero, which is 2.0 version 3.0. I'm not quite there it's yet. It's 1.0. That's oh, 1.0. All right. So <laughs> that's 1.0. You know, because because the donor did this. So how do we get to, what's the concrete, tangible, tactical way that organizations can get to the 3.0? What do they do today to improve their 
what can everybody do on this call without hiring you to improve their oh, no. donor? <laughs> I, I don't need more clients, actually. So thank you for the po for the promotion, though, Amy. Um, what can they do? Well, uh, I would say that the number one thing that we, uh, we being myself and this little group that I am part of called the Case Writers, which we're all just uh, creatives who do fundraising stuff. And um, we are very good at vetting anybody who comes and uh, is looking around to see if we'll work with them. So uh, what we're vetting is, okay, what's your approval process? If there's more than one person involved, that's <laughs> that the conversation ends right there. We don't work with committees. We don't work with amateurs. We don't work with boards. We don't, you know, the, the only people you've got to communications is not, uh, it's not a, it's not a collegial activity. You've got to have somebody who's got a ton of training, who knows what they're doing. Uh, and then you've got to have somebody that says, great, let's get it out there and see what happens. All right, here's, here's the low budget version of that. You take the best writer at your organization. You find the best writer. You read all of Tom and maybe Adrian's books. And then you write the letter or the newsletter and you don't let anybody change it. You don't let the committee change it or edit it. So that's the low budget version of, of what, what you're talking about, yeah? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. There's nothing more ludicrous than a communications committee. It's, <laughs> it's a guarantee failure. And I, and I know this from, you know, um, lots of years of experience, a lot of bad experience. And, you know, 10 years ago, Amy, I started doing, I started insisting on the verbatim rule for new clients. So I'm, writing direct mail. Direct mail is a very sensitive flower. Easy to break, easy to get zero response. You really got to know what you're doing. And, um, and so I said, look, if it, I don't want you as a client if, unless you promise you won't change one word I write. <laughs> yeah. So the problem is that your, your committees water, water it down. So pick the best writer on your team um, they don't, they, they, they're not watering it down. They don't know what they're doing. And, and wow. it's, a t it's a technical exercise. This is yeah. sales and marketing. This is not, gee, I like it. I don't like it. All right. Millie's asking, how often should we reach out to donors? Well, I mean, if, you're, if you have some kind of social media, then I would say once a day, twice a day. If you have uh, an email list, once a week is probably all you really need to do. But be interesting. Don't be, you know, I mean, most of us, what do you do in the morning when you look at your inbox? You get rid of as much of it as you can as fast as possible. So I get, I'm getting 100 emails a day at least. And the first thing I do is, okay, I can ignore that, 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 that. You don't want to be one of the ones they ignore. Now, the, the way you get into that exclusive group is you write a subject line that's actually intriguing. And, uh, and then when they open it up, because the subject line is like the envelope for a direct mail piece, when they open it up, then you pour love at them and you entertain them. Great. All right. Um, excellent. Uh, I wanted to go back for a minute and now it's gone. Damn, a senior moment. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, right. you're too young for that. <laughs> Dude, all right. Too much reading what's going on in the chat box and not paying attention to what's happening. You know what? It was about first time donors. Okay. And you were talking about treating them differently and communicating th with them differently. I mean, to me, part of it is just as simple as noticing when somebody is a first time donor, you know, having your database flag that for you so that you can acknowledge that they're making a first time gift and picking up the phone and asking them why, you know, yeah. hey, we, we, got a we got a check from you and we're so thrilled. We, we're so delighted. Absolutely. Uh, can you tell, tell us why? Tell us what motivated this gift. Why did you decide to make this gift? And just start to learn a little bit about your donors. And they will be so shocked 
that you called them, that they will pay attention the next time you write or email or call or are on social media. Um, you know, I had, uh, I had this friend call me six weeks ago at the beginning of all this COVID and say, all right, Amy, this is your field. Give me five organizations. I want to make substantial gifts. Wow. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, whatever substantial was to her. I think they were uh, four or low five-figure gifts, substantial gifts. She sent gifts in to organizations that she had never given into, given to, five of them. Six weeks later, she hasn't heard from a one. Not a thank you letter, not a receipt, not a phone call. And uh, I want to die. I want to die. You know, no, that's you want to call every each one of those and say, look, I recommended you and you failed. Well, I, yes. Anyways, so, all right. Okay. And Let's that's common, by the way, Amy. That is not, th th that is what I would have predicted. Yeah, I know. It's yeah. unacceptable. And there's no way she's going to give to those organizations. No, again. of course. They just ruined their what is called lifetime value, which is every gift that a single donor makes from first to last. If all they make is a first gift because you fail the most basic human interaction um, test, which is reciprocity, according, you know, the, again, psychology, Recipro we have built into us this, if we give somebody something, our brain expects a thank you. Now, if that thank you exceeds our expectations, wow, that's even better, because that really, you know, lifts you out of the fog. But, but as I said, most of the time, charities, they're begrudging this thank you, like, yeah, we deserve this money anyway. Yeah, I'll get around to thanking you. And it's like, oh, you don't deserve to be in this business. All right, here's the next question. Uh, Liz is asking if some donors communicate or complain that we're communicating too often, but so. we are, we're bringing in money. <laughs> Do we no, I, I hope them? they do. I hope they do. Um, <laughs> well, no, the reason I say that, and that, that's not, I'm not being facetious. That's actually a professional opinion. Um, I once asked uh, Jeff Brooks, again, I brought him up earlier. He's one of America's top fundraising direct mail writers. And I said, Jeff, you know, uh, what is your expectation when you're sending out uh, a direct mailing, let's say of a million pieces? because that's the level he works at. He said, well, we should get some, we should get, not we <laughs> hope not to get, we should get somewhere between 250 to 500 complaints. And I thought, well, that is fascinating because every charity I know, if they got one complaint, they'd shut the lights off, they'd lock the doors, and they wouldn't answer the phone for three weeks because, you know, oh my God, God, we made a, a prospective billion dollar donor unhappy. Uh, it's part of the fantasy life of uh, charities. They have no idea who is giving, why they're giving, what they generally, what their profile generally is. And if you're not getting complaints, you're probably just doing bland stuff. That's, <laughs> that's why committees exist is to create utterly bland stuff that nobody could object to because their primary goal is not to raise money using, you know, whatever professional tricks they have up their sleeve, but to not get one single complaint. And that's a mistake. Particularly yeah. now, if you're not I mean, getting complaints now, who, what are you doing? Liz, you answered your own question. You're raising money. Why would you change it, right? I mean, a few board members or volunteers or whoever who probably aren't giving that much anyways are complaining. Um, no, you listen to the numbers and you listen to the data. You don't listen to, you know, the complainers. And, you know, they're going to tell you to stop fundraising and then you're going to stop raising money. Well, I don't understand. So I mean, you can always have a conversation with a complainer. Yeah. You pick up the phone. I mean, it, this, ha this happened right away with the coronavirus thing. So there, there was a, um, 
a wonderful video done by Stephen Screen, and he's the Better Fundraising Company. So they're out in Seattle, and they did a um, an online tutorial on how to write an emergency email appeal. And if you go to their website, you can you know watch it. It's very quick, and it's it's already been used by countless small charities and they've been making millions of dollars off this email appeal. So one of the people that used it uh, was the um, United Way of Pickens County, which is South Carolina. And uh, the executive director there wrote this appeal. She wrote it pretty much as the formula specified. And, um, and then she said, oh my God, because she, she's a you know she's a colleague and so she emailed me and said oh i don't know what to do i just got chewed out by one of my biggest donors because that was his personal reaction to this emergency appeal i said well that's good news <laughs> you, you it must have been strong enough and and, uh, and then she came back after a week or two and she said, we have blown the doors off this emergency appeal. And of course, this is United Way. So they're doing basic services to people that really need help, people that have lost their jobs, people who need food, need shelter and all the rest of it. So right. everybody, everybody's asking, what's the name of that video website again? Where can they find it? Okay. The company's name is Better Fundraising Company. Okay. Yeah. Stephen Screen, Screen Like Screen Door, is the person that's a, a V, Steven, V E N, Screen. And uh, just go to their home, their home page. You'll find it, it's there because they, they're, they're, you know, they did this for just to be the good citizens. And All right. uh, yeah. All right, Lori's asking any thoughts on, um, she says she's trying to connect with everyone in her portfolio right now. Any tips for prioritizing which donors to call and which to email? Uh, how did, <laughs> do, you, do you have any thoughts on that, Tom? Uh, I, this, I will be facetious this time. Yeah, call <laughs> the oldest ones first. Um, <laughs> And for the reasons you can guess. Um, no, I, it, it, what I, well, the mantra has been since donor centricity started to gain traction, and it, it's been going for 20 years now, um, and the research gets stronger and stronger and stronger. What I recommend is you, th you look at loyalty before you look at amount. So if somebody's given you a gift, three years, actually the, the average length of time for a donor now, if they make a second gift, is just about 4.3 years. That's it. That's how long you have a donor. So if somebody's given to you for 10 years, wow, <laughs> you should be, a, you know, just regularly checking up on them and saying, how you doing? You know, what's up right. in your life? There's and at any amount, really, even, any if they're giving, amount. even if they're giving $10 a year, $25 a year, you know, those are the people, first of all, I always like to say, you don't know if they're only giving you $25 a year because you've never asked them for more. And I think that 80% of nonprofits probably don't have ask amounts in their appeal letters or on their phone campaigns or whatever. <laughs> and so, right, maybe they're giving you $25 a year because it never occurred to them that you needed more, you never asked for more, right? So that's number one. Number two is um, they are extremely loyal to you, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, they are your number one plan gift prospects, right? Everybody knows that. If they're giving to you for more than five years in a row, they're the likeliest to give you a bequest or a planned gift of another type. And so you better know what's going on with them, why they love your organization, and um, they are your best donors. So those are the ones that you should be calling first, checking in on, and asking for larger gifts during this challenging time. Yeah, I mean, it, the one of the um, formulas I teach a lot is, was, was put together by uh, Hillborn up in Canada. And it, it's a simple formula for doubling your giving. 
uh, you move something like 10% of your annual donors onto monthly instead. You call people that are giving you 250 and ask for twice as much. And then you get something like 5% of your donor base to uh, leave you a gift in their will. And that will get you to twice as much revenue coming in. Now, I just got a, I, I, one of my clients sent an, a, um, a scan of a check that they had just gotten. And it was a very typical thing. So this is a um, uh, international charity working with refugees. And, and the, the um, longtime donor had uh, passed and the, the lawyer gets in touch with the charity and, uh, and here's this check and it is for $75,000. They, they sent me a scan of it so I could see it, it was, you know, just about $75,000. And, and yet this, this is typical. Th that was a, not an unusual <laughs> charitable gift from a middle-class estate. And this person actually had kids and most of the time, you're, you're, a lot of times the, the biggest correlation is between they don't have children and they do have assets so they leave it to some you know favorite charities. But in this case they had kids, they loved the organization and they just put them in the will. Um, did they ever give a lot of money? Probably not, maybe 50 bucks a year, something like that. But Don't you, don't you love those stories? Yeah, but see, we don't, those are not war stories like one-offs. Those are actually as good as, there's a lot of statistical evidence behind that, that that actually is typical. Mm, right. <sighs> <laughs> Pay attention to those loyal donors. What are you doing differently with your loyal donors than you are with everybody else? And do you know who your loyal donors are, your low level donors? Um, what's your plan for them? Well, so, you can ask are, them actually as they come in, Amy. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, it, that they've been working on over in the UK, and um, this would be uh, Jen and, and uh, Adrian, is they're working with people like Greenpeace in Spain or some other big, bigger charities to um, survey new donors as they come in. They ask them some two simple questions. Uh, tell me the five things you, uh, the five adjectives that would describe who you really are. And the other is tell us the five adjectives or things that describe why you care about this particular charity. So you, you're asking them what their identity is and you're asking them what their connection to the charity is. And it's fascinating. What they, what they get back are, you know, hundreds, thousands of responses sometimes and they make word clouds out of them so that you can see which words pop up the most. Mm -hmm. And the words that pop up for on the one side, who are you, it tend to be things like retired, <laughs> <laughs> old, <laughs> you know, but also things like caring mm. pops up quite a bit. And then on the other cloud, why are you connected to this charity? You're looking for where there's an overlap and where the overlap is, is where you want your communications to be, that's where you're finding your new vocabulary. So if they're talking about caring here and then in the, in the connectedness word cloud, caring is also very big, then you start to use caring as one of your core concepts in your communications with them. And what they've done over there is, is pretty amazing um, in terms of during this crisis, making people feel part of something, not so, so much of fundraising, the reason it sucks, the reason people wondered, can, can we over solicit is because that's all you know how to do. You, 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 there, this is a three part process. You ask, you thank, you report. You, all you know how to do is ask. You thank poorly, you report even a, worse. And, and no wonder people just like, oh yeah, I'll never give it to them again. You know, it, an average, how many people do you give to in a year? How many organizations, Amy? Oh, uh, two dozen. Yeah, us, easy, same, 30, 40? 
Yeah. And that is the case for a lot of households. It may not be that many because maybe they have kids, they don't have any money, but they, um, they give to more than one charity. And they, you know, so if you're only in their face once a year to say, oh, hi, it's us again, we'd like some more money, you, you, they don't not even remember they gave to you. So uh, <laughs> being out of touch is a really bad idea. All right, so some quick, quick questions. Uh, one is, what's the best donor database to use? And I think you and I would probably have the same answer on that. We're going to, we're going to, I, it's Tom I can't, I can't yeah. say. All right. I can say, uh, Bloomerang, check it out. B L O O M E R A N G dot co C O not com. I don't know why I have to ask Jay. What oh, are these no, days? no, because there was a flower company that already had Bloomerang. Uh, I knew there was a reason, but it, it always strikes me as strange. Anyways, listen, you know, we're not, um, okay, so Bonnie's saying we use Bloomerang and we love it. We're not endorsing it. We're just, check it out. All right. Or we are endorsing it. Who knows? Um, okay, Tom, also somebody says out of all your books, which one should I start with? Okay, this one is probably the most generally useful. It gets into everything. Okay. Um, what, yeah. did it, what donors want? What is it called? Want? What, what your donors want and why. It's the one with the hold, puppy on the cover. Hold it up. One, where's the title? Bring it the, down. The puppy. Yeah. Okay. What your donors want. Good. Okay. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Okay. So somebody's asking, I don't know if this is more, more for me, more for you. What are your thoughts on sending a donation request by email instead of in person? Sure. Why not? Yeah. Um, <laughs> listen, you know, I'm all about, I always talk about major gifts. So I'm always talking about one-on-one, -on -one. but yeah. you're going to do both. You're going to do both. Quite frankly, I am a big proponent of not pulling your major donors out of your annual fund mailings, whether it's email or direct mail. Don't do it because what happens is that I see organizations, they pull their top 30 donors that they're hoping to meet with or hoping to call or sit down with and ask for money out of their annual fund program. Guess what? They don't get the meeting and they don't mail to them and they don't get a gift. It's a huge mistake. So you're going to do both. Um, all right, good. Let's pick out another question here. Uh, so somebody's asking about getting new donors. You have any thoughts on getting new donors? <laughs> yeah, of course I do. I mean, ahead, part, it, it, it is part of, at some level, there's machinery here. And what, um, you know, if you, I came out of commercial marketing, so I, I learned the traditional way of selling. And what you have is uh, what's called a sales lead funnel. So what's pouring prospects into the top of that funnel, into the big end, are things like your social media, uh, your website, uh, if you have events, you know, if whatever brings in new people. They've, oh, I just heard about you guys. So social media is very handy in, the, in this way. Um, now, what happens in the funnel is that a thousand or 10,000 come out, come in the top and out the bottom come 10 gifts. And it, somewhere in there, what you're doing in that funnel is putting offers in front of people. And those offers are things that are not always about money. Will you join our mailing list? Because we want to tell you what's happening in your own community, uh, you know, regularly. Every month, we're going to let you know how nature is doing in your own backyard or every, you know, whatever. And give them a reason to join that mailing list. And then you just keep hammering on them with donate buttons all, you know. <laughs> until they, one day they say, ah, oh, what the heck? Yeah, you, you're, you've been entertaining enough. I guess I'll give you a little cash. And then you have a chance to really cultivate them. All right, so Karen's asking about, um, they have some new donors, 63, Karen says, congratulations. Yeah, as, a, as, as, a, uh, as a result of their COVID-related fundraising efforts. So what's the next step, she wants to know. Treat them, um, well, it, okay, One of the th here's a very simple thing to remember. Uh, rather than saying something such as, your gift matters, you say, you matter. So take the gift 
out of the uh, out of the conversation and let them know how much they matter, not their gift that they matter. I mean, one of the things we don't talk about, but we should probably, is how special donors are. How few, even big organizations, are running on a relatively small number of uh, committed donors. You know, even an international charity, which has, um, and I'm thinking one of my clients, they get 60, 90 million dollars a year or something in, in donations. They're not getting that from tens of millions of people. They're getting it from a couple hundred thousand. And then you scale that down. You may not be in the $90 million, but you scale it down and it's going to be the same thing. You're going to have a relatively small number of people who say, yes, I care about this. And it is part of my identity. And I am going to be part of your family. You're there. Now, let's put it this way. They are not your donors. You are their charity. And once they start to own you and you're part of their, their identity, you're, you're into the big bucks or the potential anyway. Excellent. Uh, Leticia is asking about, you said report. So you ask, you thank, you report. What the heck does that mean? She wants to know. <laughs> what, what's and the Leticia, report? All yeah, you're not, uh, you're not alone. Um, <laughs> th this is part of the problem. We, uh, we know how to ask. We, we think we know how to thank. And we have no idea what the biggest question in the donor's mind is, which is... Drum roll. <laughs> yep. <laughs> did what I did my help make any difference? And that's what the report is. The report is not your service numbers like, you know, we served 575 meals to blah 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 and all the rest. Your report is yes, you're a wonderful person. You helped feed so many people who otherwise wouldn't have had a good hot meal. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Tom, you know what? It's come to the point in the session where you get to say your final words of wisdom. What do you want people leaving with? Uh, what are the key takeaways that you want to make sure that you have not left the session until you say? Ooh, okay, I'm going to read to you from something that I just wrote for this course that I was that I've been putting together and it is driving me absolutely bonkers because it is just, it's, I've, I've got a desk that's 16 feet long. It is covered with stuff that I'm trying to kind of boil down. Basically, uh, if you focus on money, you'll make less money. If you focus on the feelings of the person who is going to be your donor, you will make a lot more money. And that is just not part of the DNA right now. I think it's a perfect note to end on. <laughs> Give um, it. All right, so what I'm doing right now is I am putting in the chat box, uh, because next week on Monday, when we do this town hall again with the Capital Campaign Toolkit, Tom, you ready? We're having Seth Godin as our guest. Oh, I and, saw that and I thought, oh, you are good. And I yes. saw you interview Seth, actually, Amy. Yes. You were good. He and he's, <laughs> he's splendid. He, in, in my secular heaven, he's an angel. <laughs> yes. Well, so I just put the link in. I don't know why it didn't turn into a link. Capital Campaign Toolkit, hopefully I spelled it right, dot com slash town hall. And you can join me and Seth Godin on, on Monday. And I have to tell you, let me tell you, as we wrap up, we got three more minutes. I'm going to tell you my story of asking and persistence of the week. So five years ago, Tom's right, I had the opportunity to interview Seth Godin when he was the keynote at the big AFP International Fundraising Conference. It was five years ago, and I interviewed him. It was one of the first video interviews I ever did. <laughs> it wasn't my finest hour, but it was good enough. So a few two weeks ago, I said, you know what? Let me see if Seth Godin will come on my town hall talk and, and talk to all the good fundraisers and, and share some thoughts because he's so brilliant. So he wrote back and he said, uh, no, I won't join in a really nice way. He said, 
uh, use, the, use the video from five years ago to launch a discussion for today. He said, thanks, but no thanks. And I wrote back, I said, you know what? It's pretty out of date. I'd really like to do something more current. Let's do that. And again, very creatively, very thoughtfully, and very respectfully, he said no. So I took one more swing, and you know what? He's going to be on the show next week, so <laughs> don't miss us. <laughs> Anyways, persistence. Sometimes it ab it's about being creative, persistent, and uh, if you don't he know knew, He knew you really meant it by time number three, Amy. Yeah, yeah. So, Somebody anyways. like that is getting requests daily, probably. I, I'm but sure he is. They don't get three requests. Right. People go away after the first or second time, usually. Yeah. All right. All right. If you don't, if you don't know who Seth Godin is, Google him. You will know quickly, but you don't want to miss it. Tom, thank you so much for being an amazing <laughs> guest, as always. I always learned. I took a whole page of notes. I don't know if anybody noticed. I'm like looking away. I, I have so many websites to look up, and took, I took notes myself. All right. Thank stay you. well. Stay healthy. Thanks, Tom. I'll talk to you soon. Take care, everyone. Good luck. Bye, everybody. See you next week. Stay well.